All right, welcome along to the RT Soccer World Cup podcast. Raf Giallo here, and this afternoon I'm joined by Anthony Pine of RT Sport Online and Ireland and Liverpool legend Ronnie Whelan, who is in Doha. We're going to be looking ahead to all four quarterfinals, and also we'll talk about some of the matters off the pitch. But uh, Ronnie, you were just talking to me um, off air there, and uh, you're, I suppose you're getting you're getting used to life in Qatar now. Um, what have you made of the quality of the football so far as we head into the quarterfinals? You know what, everything about the place has been great. Um, we're so well looked after by everybody that's here. Um, the volunteers have come in from all over the world. Uh, it's, it's just been really, really good. And apart from one or two games, two or three games maybe, the football's been of a very, very high standard. I was talking to you tonight as well. The referee has been very, very good as well. VAR messed up a bit for the referees at times. But for me, the referee has been very good. Um, and it, it's the big games now coming up and all the more or less all the top teams are, are Argentina, Brazil, the European countries are still in there. Um, and this is where it really gets interesting. This is where you will see the best football. Yeah, and largely do you feel, well, I suppose if you get to the quarterfinals, you deserve to get there. But in terms of the strength of the teams that are there, obviously Morocco is probably the standout in terms of a surprise that got there. But uh, yeah, mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you feel, I suppose, of the, the, the quality of those eight teams that are there? Yeah, you, you're going to have to look at Croatia and, and Morocco as the two teams you would fancy that will be definitely able. But we don't know because Morocco come through against Spain. Um, so the, the rest are, it can go any way with them. England, France, you've got the Netherlands who, who come in there. Just no worries, no problems with the Netherlands getting in there. We haven't had any fighting in the, amongst the squad. It's, it's all been really, really nice. They played really, really well. It's the USA scored some great goals. So you've got Brazil, Argentina. I haven't been impressed with Argentina whatsoever. Um, they'll probably go on and win it now. But Messi, bit of magic the last game, um, lifts them through. Everybody's happy. I think everybody's happy that Brazil and Argentina are still here. They could meet in the next round, couldn't they? Yeah, um, that'll, be, uh, that'll be a classic that, if they do meet. That'll be a big one. But yeah, I, I, I'm not being overly impressed with Argentina. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna look ahead to all four quarterfinals uh, very very shortly. But before we do that, there are of course matters off the field, and that's been a theme with this World Cup long before um, it kicked off, Anthony. And uh, today uh, the, there was well, there was a report in the Athletic on Wednesday about the death of a migrant worker from the Philippines at a resort that was being used as a training site. And uh, the Qataris have launched a work a work safety investigation. I think what's notable here is the comments by the chief executive of the 2022 World Cup, which is Nasser Al Qatar where he said, as part of his overall comments, death is a natural part of life, whether it's at work, whether it is in your sleep. Um, he did also offer condolences to the family, but um, it, that was very notable. Yeah, it, it was notable and disappointing um, and sort of in keeping with a lot of the overly defensive um, stance they've taken around these issues. Uh, I think just before the, the World Cup started, Raf uh, al Qatar had, had said... I'll, I'll give the direct quote just to avoid any confusion around it, but he said, we can say they are highly racist given a country like Qatar, an Arab Islamic country, was able to compete with large countries that consider they are more deserving of host, hosting this tournament. So they is outside critics of certain issues around uh, Qatar, human rights issues, worker rights or lack of worker rights. Um, but something like this, when, when somebody loses their life um, in those sort of circumstances, You'd imagine the correct way to approach it is to, without any qualification, offer your condolences to the family, uh, to, to air you know, uh, your sadness around the circumstance, uh, say, yes, there'll be a full investigation. We will, you know, uh, anything that was wrong, we, we will address it and, and, and get to the root of the problem. Um, but his interview was straight away, he was extremely defensive. He, he said to the reporter who put it to him, you know, why are you asking me this? You know, we're in the middle of a great World Cup and you're asking me this? Why? Why? Like, what's the problem? And as I said, it's sort of in keeping with that tone of um, the organisers of this tournament. They, they seem to just, they can't understand why people are focusing on some of the negative stuff around the tournament. They just want people to look at the football, look at the great things. I mean, and, and the football has been great. And, you know, in terms of the, there's been undeniable uh, in terms of the, the organization and uh, the infrastructure and all that. But like people are absolutely going to talk about the negatives. They have to like it's, journalists on the ground are duty bound to to report and, and to ask about things like this. So it was it was. Uh, 
it was disappointing, but as I said, sort of consistent and in keeping with a lot of the the tone of the stance that they, they've taken around things like this uh, before the tournament and throughout the tournament. Yeah, because of course uh, there's also the discrepancy in terms of the the number of deaths as well, depending on who is discussing. So the Guardian saying six thousand five hundred uh, this this before the tournament, and then during the tournament, then uh, one of the Qatari representatives acknowledged somewhere between four hundred and five hundred. It plays into that theme as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like they, they as you say, like um, their Hassan Al Thawadi, the Secretary General of the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy of the Tournament. Uh, he, the figure he gave uh, in an interview to Piers Morgan was between four hundred and five hundred migrants uh, who died uh, as a result of development linked to the infrastructure bill for this World Cup. Um, and as you referenced there, Raf, uh, the Guardian. Uh, their estimate was around six and a half thousand migrant workers and there's other estimates that are far higher than that so uh, there's this again this this sort of um overly defensive refusal to acknowledge certain things and and batting down the hatches and well you know using words like racist because people are, are raising issues like this and questioning things like this um it's you know, the, the more they do that, the more people will pick at it and, and ask questions and, and say, you know, and look into it more. So, um, you know, it's not the last that we will hear about these things. And it's probably not the last time that we're going to see this sort of friction because these issues are, are too big for people to just, you know, ignore, not talk about or sweep under the carpet. So, uh, yeah, it's always there. It's always going to be there with this World Cup. And, and it was it was inevitable that there would be these sort of um, clouds um, but it's certainly, as I said, like it's it's any report, any journalists that are on the ground, they, they are duty bound to question and talk about any issues like this, and they will continue to do so. Yeah, and one of the outstanding issues, of course, as well, is the compensation package for migrant workers or for the families of those who have died and those who have been affected as well. Um, I was speaking to Amnesty International before the tournament, and uh, they were looking for a uh, a fee of in and around uh, 440 million as of yet. FIFA uh, nor the Qataris, they haven't really addressed whether that's actually going to happen. But the other notable thing um, is the number of visitors to Qatar as well. So uh, the Qataris, uh, Anthony, were targeting 1.2 million visitors to the country. The number at the moment standing at uh, 765,000 arriving for the first 17 days of the tournament. Yeah, um, look, I, I don't know, there's a myriad of issues of why they've, they've fallen short. I mean, um, I, I don't know, like we, there's so much negative press around this and, uh, before the tournament and, and certain countries, Denmark uh, most notably took such a strong stance uh, around, um, you know, LGBT uh, plus, Q plus uh, rights, workers' rights, migrant rights. Um, that you know would obviously put fans off traveling, and it, you can actually notice it in the stadiums. There's some games, and I'm sure Ronnie will vouch for this. There's been some games where the atmosphere has been very quiet, uh, almost non-existent, really, because certain fa fans from some countries have largely stayed away. Uh, Morocco actually are one of the countries that have brilliant support, and um, that they really travel in numbers. So there's, it's you can really tell the discrepancy in the atmosphere in, in some games. Some of the European countries, uh, not so much. So. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's sort of a testament to the 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 heightened media country uh, media coverage. Um, some of the issues have got uh, in Europe as opposed to other countries. Maybe, um, and yeah, I guess like from from their point of view, they they would obviously hope for for more. There's so much money there at play that it's not like the the financial toll is going to be significant here. I think it's just for themselves. Like they probably would have expected. Uh, higher numbers and, and, and greater visitors um, for this World Cup, but there's, there's a myriad of issues, but not, not least the um, negative talking points around it in, in the build-up and throughout. Yeah, and Ronnie, I suppose just on that point, in terms of uh, the fan groups that you've noticed the most, obviously this is a World Cup that's been happening in a very small geographic place. Uh, which ones have you noticed most? It seems from TV, at least Argentinians, Saudi Arabians earlier in the tournament were some of the you know the the larger groupings of supporters from um, overseas that were there. Yeah, Anthony was right. Morocco the other day, great following. Um, Senegal, although it wasn't a big following. They just never stopped singing throughout the game. That they just made the whole thing. They were 
They were um, singing louder and dancing all through the game. I don't know how they kept it going, but they did. Um, but the thing I've noticed with the crowd as well, when FIFA put up the, the attendance, the, the stadium might only hold 45, and for some reason there's lots of seats that are empty, and the, it'll come up as 46,542. I, I don't know how they're working it out, how they're doing it, but they seem to be adding numbers onto a lot of the, a lot of the, the crowds in the grounds. Yeah, and I suppose the atmosphere, obviously the eight stadiums are not too far from each other as well. Like how, what have you, I suppose, how has the interaction been between supporters as, you, as you've noticed it as you're travelling around? After about five days, six days or so, I just said, I don't know whether it was George or Dara, I said, isn't this a, magnif a magnificent atmosphere to bring your kids to football? Because there's so many kids, there's no trouble, there's no jobs running in the streets, there's no people falling over drunk. It is just a great atmosphere for people to go and watch football matches. Yeah, and uh, I suppose in terms of atmosphere as well, I mean, uh, I don't know where you stand on the whole. We'll, we'll start on this first quarter final, which is uh, tomorrow, Friday, uh, three o'clock uh, Irish time, Croatia against Brazil at the Education City Stadium. Uh, Ronnie, where do you stand on the whole uh, dancing celebration thing? Because it looks like Brazil came well prepared to do that. And uh, there's a good chance they'll probably get to uh, test out a few, mo few more moves uh, against the Croatians tomorrow. Yeah, uh, the Brazilians um, are starting to look really, really good for me. Um, the Samba's coming back into it, you say, with the dancing, the manager's dancing, everybody's dancing. And Roy did have a go at them, didn't he, about what they were doing and dis uh, disrespectful and things like that. But they've all come out and said it. it's the Brazilian way. We're happy. We want to celebrate with each other. We do dances. It's what they do. They've always done it. Um, it's nothing new. It's good to see, but it's also good to see that Brazil are starting to play better now. Neymar's back in. Um, Richarlison scoring a couple of goals so it's 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 Brazil for me for yeah. the whole lot maybe but for, for the, for the Brazil whole lot. against Cameroon maybe for the whole lot or against Cameroon um, sorry against Croatia um, yeah you would have to fancy them to win it easily Croatia looked very very tight in the Japan game it, it was, they won on penalties a few of the the older um, players in the squad were starting to flag a little um, but they've got through. I think this is the end. But yeah, um, obviously the Brazilians look really good against uh, South Korea. But again, we have to factor in the way South Korea set up, and they were once they once they conceded that early goal, they sort of fell apart. Uh, Croatia yeah. are sort of a very dogged team, Ronnie. I mean, in terms of obviously they're very technically good as well. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. Modric's quality is probably the, he's arguably going to be the best player on the pitch, uh, arguably. But uh, do you hold out much hope for them in terms of can they take this to extra time? Obviously they've got they will have tired legs once they get there. Yeah. They've always got a chance, the Croatians, because they do battle. They battle hard. You mentioned Modric. I love Brozovic, who sits in front of the back four. I love Casimiro with Brazil, who sits in front of the back four. The jobs they do are the jobs nobody really sees. They win the ball back. They give it quickly to the forwards, and they let them go and, and do what they can up front. But, um, no, they will not lie down, Croatia. They will give it everything they've got, as they've always done in tournaments. Um, it won't be easy for Brazil, but I think they've just got too much. And what's your take on better with or without Neymar? They'll always be better with Neymar. Um, he's the iconic player. He, everybody's looking to him to, to do the magic that Pelé used to do or who are all the Brazilian greats down the years. Um, Neymar's the one they're looking to now. He's had, a, he's had a rest. His ankle looked absolutely fine in the game the other day. So it may be time for him now to try and kick on and... Mbappe's been the best so far. For I think everybody says that, but Neymar will now want to kick on to that to that level and try and get up there with Mbappe. Yeah, and Anthony, I suppose as well when we look at this fixture as well, Croatia were taken to penalties, so they're you know, and especially when you factor in the older players as well. But uh, Brazil, they were even able to uh, substitute the goalkeeper, um, bringing on Weverton. So it means they've used all twenty six players uh, during the tournament so far. So that. That maybe in the maybe in the first half won't be too apparent, but as the game goes on, um, I suppose that discrepancy in terms of fatigue levels will probably show. Uh, you, you'd expect it would show. I mean, this is why these tournaments are so difficult. You know, it's just the rhythm of it, and I think you know it gets harder. Obviously, the deeper you go into the tournament because you're playing better teams. Now, Croatia are twelfth in the world. They're ranked twelfth in the world, so we're not talking about. You know, this this wouldn't be a, an enormous underdog upset or anything. Like it's it's possible, as Ronnie says, it's, they they've got they're not without a chance. But um, you, you would fancy Brazil. I mean, they, they do look good. They they've got such great firepower, such imagination and creativity going forward. The only thing I'd say about Croatia is that there's absolutely no way 
they're going to open themselves up, you know, to be carved open. Like they'll probably play this cute that, you know, conserve energy as much as they can, sit deep. They're so good technically that they can sit deep in their own half and still play their way out of trouble a lot of the time. Like they're all really comfortable in tight spaces. And Modric is, is obviously the, the, the big name, the obvious one at that. But there are a lot of players who are really good at doing that. So they're not without a chance. But yeah, you, I, I'd be with Ronnie. You, you fancy Brazil and um, they will take some stopping because they've, they've got a lot, of, a lot of firepower. Yeah, and obviously, as you said, Ronnie, Croatia are probably unlikely to be able to test if Brazil have weaknesses. We probably won't see it there. Croatia don't particularly have pace in forward areas. But if you were looking at the Brazil, uh, strongest Brazil team, where where are the weaknesses that you see? They do seem defensively strong, but uh, I'm sure like every team, there is a, there's a chink in the armour there somewhere. Yeah, once, once they start to get an injury to Brazil um, across the back four, you're now having a centre-back playing right-back or a centre-back playing left-back when they have to fix things I think that's the only weakness for me really in the team is somewhere along that back line that somebody doesn't do his job properly on the night. Um, the, the rest for me, Casimero sitting in front, um, just dictating play and the, and the Neymar up front, Richarlison up front. Yes, they're all OK, but I think the back four can be got at. OK, and uh, the 7 o'clock game on Friday, of course, is Netherlands against Argentina. A lot of classic games here. I think we were talking about it on the last podcast, Anthony, but uh, it, my first World Cup was the 1998 one, so I always remember Dennis Bergkamp, that goal, um, that last-minute winner against the Argentinians. But also, I think what was even better, arguably, um, and the goal was fantastic, but the, the Dutch commentary for it was uh, was something else. Yeah, it's an iconic moment. That was a brilliant game. And, and like these had a, a battle at Ding Dong in 2014. If you remember in the semis, um, Argentina bet the Netherlands on penalties. And Van Gaal was the manager of the Dutch side then. So he said himself, they've got a bit of unfinished business. There's a little bit of needle coming into this as well, Raf. Um, Di Maria had a, had a go at Van Gaal in the press that he was a bad coach. And Van Gaal had his, had his say back to today uh, in his press conference but you know he's he's a clever coach Gangal. He's, he's 71 years of age he's no fool you know he has eight of his squad are under the age of 23 and eight of them have less than 10 caps so they need he's really important like he's such an experienced seasoned figurehead he's 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 very important to the group now it's stating the obvious he's the manager but when you see, like today, for example, the way he handled that press conference, so that you know those comments were thrown back on the Di Maria comments, and he just diffused the whole thing. You know, he said he turned it around. And he said, "Well, you know, look, you know, some people would say I'm not a bad coach." And he had to pay Memphis to pay was beside him. He said, "You know, I had this guy at Man United, and you know he thinks I did a pretty good job with him. And like sometimes I kiss him on the lips now to, to tell him how good he is, and he tried <laughs> to give him a kiss. And you know, it's all a bit of a joke and all that, but he's he's just diffusing the situation. You know, he's being clever." Uh, relax in the camp. They can be, and they have got stick in their own country for this. They're, they're not as easy on the eye as other Dutch teams we've seen down the years. This is not total football. But they're well set up. They have a plan. They know what they're doing. They have some good players. They're capable a little bit dour at times, but they're capable of turning it on and producing like flashes of real quality. So um, I think Argentina are going to find it tough going, I have to say, uh, against Holland, you know, they, they, they're going to make it really difficult for them to, to break them down. And look, you've got Messi, you've always got a chance. But if you completely shackle Messi and lock him up or starve him of the ball as much as you can or push him away from your goal as much as you can, it's, just, it's, it's hard to see where it's going to come from Argentina. Like, who's going to pick the lock if he can't do it? Yeah, and I suppose the other thing, Anthony, as well, you mentioned Van Hal. Um, obviously, he would have been the manager when Ajax and a very young, largely very young Ajax side won the Champions League in 1995. So he's very, he's, I think he's always had that thing with young players. But the other thing as well, of course, is his health situation as well seems to have also galvanised and brought that team together. Yeah, that, that, that's been spoken about as well. I mean, the, look, he is he is that kind of father figure and, and he's been around. They all know he's, he's so experienced. He knows what he's doing. So, uh, yeah, there's... The, there's no harm for things like that to unify the group even more. But look, they're in a World Cup. They're in a World Cup quarterfinal. They will have that, you know, natural sort of arrogance about themselves and think, well, of course we can go all the way. Not everybody will be tipping Holland, I don't think, at this stage even. But I think amongst themselves, they'll they'll fancy it. Um, and I would fancy them on Saturday. Sorry, uh, 
tomorrow night, Friday, Friday night to, to get past Argentina. And Ronnie, um, I suppose with your Liverpool hat on, in terms of Virgil van Dijk, I mean, this is, it's actually, it's kind of funny to think he's 31 and this is his uh, first major tournament. Mm. He missed the last one, uh, the Euros due to injury and yeah. the Netherlands didn't qualify uh, earlier, uh, earlier in his career for some other tournaments. What have you made of his uh, performances so far? Because he has been criticised at Liverpool um, this season, maybe with, a, 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 and I think he's been viewed as being at fault with a couple of defensive slip ups, especially away from home. But in the World Cup so far, what have you thought of him? I honestly have to tell you that I haven't seen Holland play that much at all because we've been off doing different games at different times and things like that. But the bits I have seen, him and Aki at the back next to him, and um, he looks comfortable, he looks fit. Um, he hasn't had a great start to the season, the first half of the season with Liverpool, definitely. It's, he's not up to the standard. He's always set himself. But I think he's he's all right, as long as he comes through the whole tournament now and he's not injured again when he goes back to Liverpool. Um, that's all I'd be worried about. But no, he looks perfectly all right. Yeah, and from the Argentinian point of view, um, obviously a lot of people are hoping, um, a lot of neutrals are hoping that Lionel Messi can crown uh, his career with the World Cup like Diego Maradona did. Would you say if he were to pull and it would be largely him sort of dragging Argentina to glory if it does happen, would that be a bigger achievement for you than what Maradona did in 1986? Obviously it's very hard to compare the two teams. Yeah, it'd be bigger, Messi, because I, I don't think this is the greatest team ever that Argentina put out on the football pitch. Um, Messi will have to do an awful lot more than Maradona did to drag them to this World Cup. Um, Maradona had, for me, had better players around him. Um, he, he was immense, Maradona, but um, I don't think Messi can drag these through. He, he would, Maradona would have been younger than Messi as well. What's Messi now, 25? Or, um, so he's, he's getting on as well. He'd love to win the World Cup, and I'd like Argentina to win it for him. But I can't see it happening. Yeah, and in terms of the, I suppose, the matchup between the do, these two teams. So, uh, of course, the Dutch are going to be playing a 3-5-2 or at least, uh, you know, back three. Yeah. And uh, obviously, Frankie de Jong sort of playing in that playmaker role. Depay and Cody Gakpo uh, further forward. And then Argentina, it depends, again, who plays alongside Messi. I think Di Maria is a doubt for this game. So that might affect how they line up uh, tactically. But... In terms of where the spaces are going to be and potentially, let's say, where the Dutch are going to stop Messi and maybe where Messi can find a little bit of space, what areas of the field do you see this uh, battle largely playing out? I am, um, is it Dumfries? Yeah, Denzel Dumfries, yeah. Right, right sided player. I remember, was it the Euros or the last World Cup or whatever? And I'd never seen a player playing in a sort of a, a wide wing back or a right back position um, be so influential in football matches for a full-back or, or a right-side midfield. Um, and he started to do that again. He scores the night. He, he creates two goals from freeze. It's people like there that I'll see the Dutch getting at Argentina. The two down the sides, go and get at the full-backs. Um, we talk about total football with the, with the Dutch. The, the first goal they scored, the, the pie scored the other night against USA, was so close to perfect football. Uh, it was about 14, 15 passes. They're all one touch, bang, 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 bang. It's gone to the other end and scored. They, they have got this flair about them as well. Um, but I think down the, the wide right mainly, um, I think they can get at Argentina there. Yeah, and in terms of pressing Argentina or maybe sitting back, so um, the Dutch have been a little bit more passive in terms of how they, they press the ball um, during this tournament. But we saw what Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia pressed really high and played a really high line against the Argentinians. It paid off. Other teams have uh, maybe sat back a little bit and had a little bit of joy as well. Uh, what what do you feel looking at that Argentina team? What's the best way to, I suppose, stop them um, when they're in possession? Is it to press high on them or to actually sit deep? And obviously, it, the onus then is on largely Messi to try and pick his way through. Yeah, I don't think the Dutch will change. I think they'll sit back. They'll let them have it up to the halfway line. We've seen what they did against USA when they do win it back and break quickly. Um, that'll be their plan. They'll sit there, um, hopefully break Argentina down, somebody bit a uh, bad ball, and then they're all primed. They, let's go. We'll go forward. We'll run. Um, I don't think they'll change that. and that's, that's how they'll do it. Yeah, and then on Saturday, the third of the quarterfinals, Morocco against Portugal, three o'clock. And like all our matches, live on RT2 and the RT player, and also we'll have live blogs on rt.ie slash sport. Um, Anthony, I suppose the... 
um, the whole <laughs> focus on Ronaldo hasn't really gone away. The news in Portugal, or at least reported in Portugal today, about uh, the possibility that he uh, there was a possibility he could have walked away from the camp. Obviously, this is unprecedented in happening in World Cups. Obviously, that the captain of a national team might uh, might leave uh, <laughs> might, might leave the camp. But uh, um, this Ronaldo focus it will not go away. No, I mean, look, it's it's. It's almost there's a sadness to it in a way that, that this brilliant career is descending into this just petulance, you know, with Manchester United and now with his own country. Um, you'd wonder what was going through his head when he was watching his team dismantle Switzerland and Ramos banging in a, a brilliant hat trick and Portugal looking. It has to be said, Raf. I mean, they did look better without him. They looked like a, a more rounded, balanced team without him. And, and that's the thing about Ronaldo. Um, he's just he is what he is. He, he goes down as one of the greats, an, an unbelievable player. But a lot of the time, the way the game has gone in the last five years, particularly, teams are so systemic. They're, they're, there's a system, a lot of them, the top teams, um, probably triggered by, you know, Guardiola's Barcelona, Man City team, Klopp's Liverpool. Um, it, they're systemic. So, like, they're often greater than the sum of their parts. And Ronaldo is just total, he's so mercurial. Uh, he he can't buy into that anymore. He doesn't have to let Messi's the same. Like so, he needs to be just doing his own thing, um, and therefore it kind of feels like he's getting left behind now. And he's not going to start this game. You know, he's not going to come into that side now. And it seems like he's being disrupted behind the scenes. And you know, having looked at Morocco, who I've been really impressed with. You know, this this is a, Morocco haven't have conceded one goal in the last seven matches, and that was an own goal against Canada. Um, they are. A really dogged outfit, and they've got some good players like Hakimi, Ziyech, uh, Amrabat has been really good. Bufal, uh, you know, the, the, the keeper Bono, th this is a decent side, like, and they have they're in that sweet spot of having nothing to lose because they've already defied expectations to get this far. But are they capable of beating Portugal? I, uh, Portugal were brilliant, by the way, against the Swiss. But this, this is a really interesting game, actually. I'm, I'm looking forward to it because I've enjoyed watching. From Morocco, I think they're they're they've been one of the, the stories of the tournament so far. Um, and as I said, I don't expect Ronaldo to start, but if he just kept his head on, he's a great sub. <laughs> now, if you're one nil down, you're throwing him on for the last fifteen minutes. It's just you'd wonder where his head is at right now. You know how they're they're playing it down Portugal, aren't they? They're saying, look, you know, it's this talk that he was going to quit. That's there's nothing in it. But you'd wonder what's what's going on. You know, the ego is so large there that. You know, he's, he's not going to be happy sitting on the bench for anybody. So, some interesting subplots. Would yeah. you not think that it's... Sorry, but would you not think, Andy, that it's, it's all because Messi wants to be about Messi? Uh, sorry, uh, Ronaldo um, has to be in the limelight everywhere. Um, oh, Ramos gets okay. the hat-trick. Everybody's thinking the headlines will be all about Ramos. No, it's about um, Ronaldo and what he's doing. He, he, he does it all the time. He takes that... The, the limelight away from anybody who's getting anything better than him and he gets himself back into there. That could be the biggest thing um, against the Portuguese as, well, as how Ronaldo is acting and what he's doing. Um, he doesn't look as if he wants to speak to any of the players. He, he, he's just moping all the time. Um, so that could be the, uh, the only thing that will go against him. I think if they can put up with that, they'll win the game fairly easy. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky situation, obviously, for the manager, Fernando Santos. But um, I guess for him, the, the thing that's made it much, much easier for him, I guess, Ronnie, is the what Gonzalo Ramos did and all the players that seem to flit in and around him against, uh, against Switzerland. Yeah, it was um, a great display from a what, 21 year old coming into the team. Um, the way he took his goals from the first one, which he lashed him with his left, the second, or the last one, the little dink over the keeper with his right. Um, if, if you know, you would expect somebody like Ronaldo, a, a senior player, um, so folk famous, to have gone up to that kid straight away after the game, hugged him, and said, Magnificent, the best, it, it, it's great. But he didn't, he walked off. Um, that to me would annoy everybody in the squad, and maybe it'll help, hopefully, it'll, it'll pull them all together more so. Um, let, let Ronaldo sit on his own at breakfast or whatever, just let him get on with his own thing, and we'll, we'll go on and try and win the World Cup.
Yeah, and from the Morocco point of view, of course, uh, they've done really well, as Anthony said. I mean, defensively, they've been resolute. That was seen against Spain, uh, took it to took it to extra time and penalties, and then of course uh, Bono, um, not our Bono from U two, yeah. but uh, their Bono uh, proved to be uh, proved to be the hero. Uh, now the challenge, obviously, is to raise their game again um, against the Portuguese. If you cast your mind back to Italia ninety, and then maybe the aftermath in those few days after the you know the the, pen, the famous penalty shootout win over Romania and then you're going into that Italy game how was it difficult sort of raising yourselves again or what was the atmosphere in the squad at the time the atmosphere was great um probably except for me because I was a bit like Ronaldo and I wasn't getting a game and I was moaning and moping about all the time <laughs> um not, not anywhere near to Ronaldo um no everybody was fine everybody um got themselves sorted there didn't seem to be anybody as far as I remember anybody in the squad saying I'm knackered I don't want to play um, everybody was up for it again. You're playing, you're playing Italy in in Rome. You know what I mean. If you can't be up for that game, um, but I honestly, I'll go back to that Ireland game. I honestly felt we were robbed that day. Um, Scalacci scored, yes, but I thought the referee absolutely robbed us. I've looked at it again that game. Um, I went up to the referee after the game and said, "You you're cheating. You, it's terrible what you've done." Um, but no, everybody was ready enough for that game. Yeah, and for Morocco as well, I mean, everyone's focused on the defensive part of the pitch and they might have a couple of players missing because there were uh, a few limping towards the end. And I think Aguirre mm -hmm. from West Ham also uh, also went off and he's been he's been really impressive. But the other thing, I guess, Ronnie, from what you might have seen of them, they seem to be a really technically good team. When they have the ball, oh, yeah. they, they, they play well as well. Yeah, they can pass, they can all play. Um, you look at the penalty that, that won the game, the little dink. Um, the, 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 yeah, they've got so much class about them. They can pass themselves out, out of tight spaces as well. Um, these are all gifted players. Um, they haven't had the limelight, your Brazils, your Argentinas, or your uh, France and England. Um, but it, they, they won't. They definitely won't go down without a fight. Um, it, it, it's an interesting game, but I just don't think they've got enough to win it. Yeah, and uh, then the final uh, quarter final being uh, England against France, seven o'clock on Saturday. Anthony, I think this is probably the one uh, probably most people are looking forward to. Oh yeah, yeah, no, it's a blockbuster, isn't it? This is it. Like as Ronnie said earlier, once we get to this stage, this is where it gets. You know, you get the real tasty games, and and this is this. Hopefully, it lives up to the hype. Um, you know, the thing is, like when you sort of strip away. The, the talk around England and you know we're so close to England and can watch their TV coverage and listen to the pundits and you know they do so occasionally get carried away with themselves but I think all things being equal England getting to the quarterfinals like if they were to lose on Saturday night you'd sort of go that was probably that's what you would have expected probably you know, like quarterfinals is a par for, for England in terms of the tournament now there, I'm sure there'll be Wales of uh, despair if they go out and there'll be plenty of people pouring over guard Southgate's, uh, Southgate's tactics, whatever way he goes at it. But I think anything beyond this, and they're probably going a little bit beyond you know, what you would have expected before the tournament. Now, that being said, I do think England have a chance, a real chance. I think they're, I, I like the look of England. Um, they're another team, they're sort of like the Dutch. You know, they have a way of playing, he has a system. It's not always brilliant to watch, but they've got very good players within it. You know, they've got technically really good players and they've got a good bench. They've got a deep bench. Raheem Sterling is back now. He's coming back on Friday, isn't he? So he's going to come back into the squad. He's another option. The likes of himself, uh, Grealish, you know, players like that, that are, are game changers if you need them. So, uh, of course, the, the man of the moment, Mbappe, player of the tournament, um, that's what they've got to try and stop. And that's going to be the biggest thing for England because... You would say the main potential weakness they have is a lack of pace at the back, um, particularly Harry Maguire. Um, and you know, I know that Mbappe would probably drift out wide, and it's there's a lot of talk about him coming up against Kyle Walker. Um, but that's where France are going to try and get up, you know, that's what they're going to try and expose. So, yeah, it's it's I hope it lives up to the hype, Brad, because it, it really it could be a, a classic, a classic World Cup match. Yeah, these two have never actually met in the knockout stages of a, of a World Cup either. I think all uh, any time they have faced each other, really, it's been uh, group stage matches. The one thing, um, Ronnie, I guess, is what we haven't seen yet. Like Southgate has done brilliantly for uh, in his time managing England, and they've become a real tournament team. The one thing that 
will have to be answered against France is how they shape up in tournament football against a really elite team because that's the one area where they have fallen short. Yeah. Um, I fancy France to win this game. But I also fancy whoever wins this game will go on and win the tournament. I, I think that highly of England, but I don't think they're good enough to beat France. I've said France from early on to win it. And they have looked extremely, extremely good. Um, England are sticking to the 4-3-3. Henderson's been brilliant in this, in this tournament. What he's got through. Um, yeah, there's so many players in that squad that can't change the game. But I think when you've got someone like Mbappe and even Griezmann as well. I, I, I've looked at Griezmann closely in this competition and he gets himself into tremendous spaces. He finds spaces everywhere. And then he gets over close to Mbappe and gives him the ball quickly so he can go on and run at anybody he wants to run at. But Griezmann and Mbappe, for me, are the two that could change this whole game. Um, Bellingham will, will do his runs forward, but I think the, the, the guile, the guile of Griezmann, um, getting balls into the box for Giroud, getting balls down the side for Dembele or, or Mbappe, um, I think he's pivotal to the game. Yeah, we'll talk about it, maybe England's uh, potential change in formation uh, shortly. But as you mentioned, France and where Griezmann kind of sits within the team, um, Kenny Cunningham and uh, Stephen Kelly were having a, a debate in studio a few days ago during the last 16 games, uh, just after the France game, whether they would drop Dembele and put a third midfielder in there. If you were in Deschamps' shoes, would you just keep it as is, uh, you know, with the 4-2-3-1 they're playing, or would you actually look to shift it? I think Dembele could roast Shaw. I think he could get, take him on no problem. He's got pace, he's quick feet. Um, I don't think Shaw will have a chance against him. I'd leave Dembele and Mbappe and Griezmann. Um, and then you've got Rabiot and... Um, Chouameni. Chouameni. Um, yeah, so and that's perfect. That's the perfect setup for France for me. I wouldn't go messing about when I need them. Would you go messing about in terms of England? Uh, you know, they, they've obviously, as you said, they played 4 3 3, but would you, do you expect them to move to the back five? I would be very surprised because I think that the three midfielders, Rice, Bellingham, and, and Henderson, are doing a great job. And that allows then whoever is in the front three, Harry Kane, yes, and then whoever is on either side of them, um, be it Rashford, Saka, Mount, whoever is going to be there. But I wouldn't go messing about it. Because I think that's a formula set on and, and, and it's looking really, really good at this moment in time. So I don't see a reason for trying to change. Uh, so how, um, and I know um, like there's the, the, obviously there's the thing about Kylian Mbappe and defending pace is probably the hardest thing to do in football for, for a defence. How would you look to shackle Mbappe if you were in England's shoes? You're just going to have to get men around them. You, you, there's, there's really not an awful lot you can do about someone that quick. You know, you could get two people around him every time and he could probably go past them every time. Um, you, you are praying as well that he he's has an off day. Every player has an off day. You don't play great every day. So uh, it'd, be, it'd be hard on the French if he does have an off day. I don't see him having an off day and I also see his pace. Um, I also see his pace being a major factor in, in how France play, whether they're going to play long balls over the top to him or whether they're going to play short to him and let him run at people. Um, and but they will be the one in this game who's going to decide which team goes through. Yeah, and obviously England have weapons of their own. Uh, Harry Kane's obviously a certain starter. In terms of the, if they do stick with 4-3-3, who, who do you expect to flank him and who has impressed you most of those options that are usually around him? Rashford had, did impress me on the, the, the day he started. Again, it's one of those, they're all blurred into one game, these um, but then when he came on off the bench recently, he didn't look as if he was happy um, because he'd been on the bench. He didn't come off as if he was happy. Come on, I'll, let me, I'll have a go. I'll show you again what I can do to the manager. Um, and that, that would worry me about. So that would, he wouldn't be for me. I'd play Sterling. I'd, I'd put Raheem Sterling back in. Um, I know he's had a, the problem back at home. Um, but he said he's coming back out and, he, and he's happy to come back out. I'd have Sterling in and I'd play Foden. I'd have Sterling, Kane and Foden. I think Foden's a magnificent player. Yeah, he most certainly is. Now, uh, as we're coming towards the end of it, it's time to stick the predictive hat on So for both of you. But first, uh, England, France, uh, how are you calling this, Ronnie? France. Okay. And then Morocco, Portugal? Portugal. Okay. And, uh, of course, the Dutch against Argentina? I'm going Dutch on this one. 
Oh, interesting. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> going against the curve. Yeah. And uh, then Brazil and Croatia. Yeah, you have to go for Brazil. Okay, and Anthony, same. I'm gonna we're gonna go in the other direction though. Brazil, Croatia. Uh, Brazil. And uh, Argentina, Netherlands. The Dutch. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Portugal, Morocco. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Morocco. And listen to Ronnie chat about the, the the atmosphere in the Ireland camp at Italia 90 after the penalty win. Um, Ireland then came up against like Italy, the host country. It was such a difficult quarter final, but they were unlucky. And and that's the thing. Like this, they're in the sweet spot of low ex, like not a lot of pressure because they defied expectation, but lots of ability in the team and really really difficult to play against. So yeah, I'll, I'll say Morocco. Yeah, there'll be a few U2 puns, obviously, if Bono gets as far as the semi-finals, kind of Elevation, or uh, what's the other song as well? <laughs> vertigo, Beautiful maybe. Day, yeah, yeah. Vert <laughs> Vertigo, and the, getting Vertigo in the semi-finals. And then finally, Anthony, England, France. Uh, yeah, Fra I'll say France. I'll say okay. France. I, I totally agree with Ronnie. I actually think the winner is the, is the team that can go all the way, the two of them. I think they've got yeah, both of so I suppose, Ronnie, um, looking at those ones, I presume you're predicting a uh, repeat of the 1998 World Cup final, France-Brazil? Um, yes. With France yeah. to win it. Yeah. Okay, France to win it. We'll, uh, we'll hold you to that uh, yeah. <laughs> on, the, on the 18th of December uh, when it comes to that. But anyway, all the matches, all the quarterfinals, semifinals, third, fourth place, playoff and final, of course, are going to be on the on RT2 and the RT player uh, live blogs. And uh, you can find all the goals on our Twitter, Facebook, and uh, also there'll be podcasts on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts between now and the end of the tournament. Ronnie Whelan, uh, thanks for coming on today. And also Anthony Pine. Thanks, thanks very much.